Now let us move to the major part of the event. And for that, I would now call our today's speaker and of course, center of attraction, Mr. Padmanabha Reddy to present his views and opinions on the topic, isolation, loneliness, and fear, understanding George Orwell's dystopian worlds. Now the stage is yours, Mr. Reddy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, History Society, uh, Shamdal College. Uh, uh, my name is Padmanabha Reddy. I'm from uh, Motilal Nehru College, Department of English. I'm in my third year. So uh, I'll start by introducing everything and then go step by step what I feel about uh, George Orwell and his works. The world in the 20th century was far different compared to the present day. Two world wars, a cold war, the fall of colonial empires, the rise of nation states with their own unique identity. This century also saw the rise of many nations uh, under new ideologies and also succumbed to their death under the same ideologies. So one of such nation is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or USSR, which formed as a union of states under a common practice uh, under a common promise of equality in respect and labor under the Bolshevik party, but succumbed to near totalitarian state under Joseph Stalin and his oppressive policies. There is no, there is no wonder in stating that uh, Soviet Union had achieved its greatest height under Stalin, which uh, includes the winning of a world war and becoming a superpower who was even involved in a cold war with the United States. Many criticized the rule of Stalin and his infamous detective agency, the KGB. Amongst these critics was a British writer and essayist, Eric Arthur Blair, who was uh, popularly known as George Orwell. His satire, Animal Farm and the dystopian uh, novel 1984 are two of his most important works, uh, which helped him gain worldwide acclaim. Now, dystopian writings represent a very unpleasant imaginary world in which ominous tendencies of our present social, political and technological order are projected into a disastrous future of culmination. So again, uh, George Orwell published Animal Farm at the height of the Second World War and 1984 after the war ended. After fighting the Spanish Civil War for the Republicans uh, against the Nationalists, he realized that the, commun uh, the communists were more interested uh, in Stalin's foreign policy rather than well-being of their own country. The reflections of this war can be seen in both of his novels, Animal Farm in 1984. By looking at both of these novels and their dystopian worlds through the lens of psychology, we can delve into the portrayal of isolation, loneliness, and fear in Orwell's works. We, will also, we shall also take the help of uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's uh, most famous political document, The Prince, and Freud's theory of uh, isolation and ego and the id as a basis for understanding the behavior of the characters in these worlds. So to introduce our writer, George Orwell, he was born as Eric Arthur Blair on 25 June 1903 in Motihari, Bihar, and was a son of a British colonial civil servant. He was educated in England, and then he, le le then he left for Eton College, joined the Imperial uh, Indian Police in Burma, where he wrote uh, his uh, first novel, The Burmese Days, and uh, which was then a British colony. He resigned in 1927 and decided to become a writer. In 1928, he moved to Paris, where... Uh, where lack of success as a writer forced him to uh, do series of menial jobs. He wrote in this, uh, he wrote in this book, uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, which was published in 1933. He took the name of George Orwell shortly before the publication of uh, Burmese Days. So as an anarchist in uh, late 1920s and by the 1930s, he had begun to consider himself as a socialist. In 1936, he was commissioned to write an account of poverty among unemployed miners in Northern England, which resulted in the road to vegan pyre. Later in 1936, Orwell again traveled to Spain to fight for the Republicans and all the whole story goes along and all these experiences, these turned him into a lifelong anti-Stalinist. So in 1945, Animal Farm again was published. Uh, it was a political fable set in a farmland, but based on Stalin's betrayal of Russian revolution. It made Orwell's name and ensured he was financially comfortable for the first time in his life. In 1984 was published four years later, set in an imaginary totalitarian future. The book made a deep impression with its little and uh, which is a little title 1984 and many, many phrases such as big brother is watching you new speak double think. And all these all words again, and these entered into popular usage. By now, again, uh, uh, Orwell Orwell died on 21st uh, January 1950 due to tuberculosis. Again, uh, coming back to coming back to the history, uh, and after the World War, even after the World War, uh, 
uh, ended with the mutual destruction of both the Axis and Allied powers. There was a skepticism among people concerning peace. With the Soviet Union blockading the railway, road, and can canal access to the Western controlled areas of Berlin, the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union began. Uh, George Orwell was a supporter of the socialist principles, but again, he hated totalitarian rule. He viewed Stalin and his policies as responsible for a totalitarian rule in the Soviet Union, a nation that was virtually isolated from the rest of the world due to its closed economy. If we look at uh, one of the two most, again, uh, important works of Orwell, 1984 and Animal Farm, we can notice that dark satire against uh, Soviet Union and its satellite states. The idea of freedom is put into test in both the novels. It is ironic as the revolution in both the novels as well as in our real world happen with the promise of greater freedom and improved lifestyle. But, uh, but as the novel progresses, you notice a promise being broken and the people being fed propaganda and subjugated for the rulers' personal gain. The characters of Winston Smith and Boxer are a stark representation of the Russian working classes under oppressive rule. In the dystopian world of Oceania in 1984, it is the big brother who is the charge in charge of all the happenings in the country. He has an eye over everyone through his secret microphones, spies, and most importantly, the telescreens, which are mandatory in every single house. It is a world where marriages are allowed only for the reason of producing children or quote unquote duty towards the party, as they call it. Any sort of attachment or romantic love is frowned upon and is punishable. Again, we see these kinds of things also repeated in the Nazi Germany, where uh, women were presented with medals and women were presented with uh, many gifts for bearing children. So again, uh, divorce in 1984 is not allowed, but again, living separately is allowed. Marriage according to will or having a romantic relationship with any person is punishable. This tells us the level of isolation that a person feels in this world. Even if a person manages to live with his or her mate after marriage, he or she will be isolated as having any feelings or affection is not in the good books of the party. Maintaining a secret relationship or an affair with someone is futile, as we noticed in the case of Winston, who rebelled against the party's rules and had a romantic relationship with Julia, where they were being spied upon all the time. And uh, uh, from the time they, they felt were safe, they were, everything was being spied upon. Every house has a camera or a telescreen unit, which is mandatory by the government. And uh, it can hear anything about whisper. Almost every area that you travel has either microphones or cameras. Doesn't this sound very familiar? No, I'm not talking about North Korea over here. I'm not talking about even the big boss over here, which is again adaptation of the Western reality show, quote unquote, Big Brother, which is again taken from Orwell. The eye of big boss is what Orwell talks about. The, I am talking about the rest of the world presently. Every step, every breath, every tap on our cell phones, everything is recorded by somebody. Don't believe me. Search about a Harry Potter book online and within no time you will start getting ads of Harry Potter books. Go to a new city, it will give you recommendations regarding places to stay and foods to eat. How is the internet knowing everything? It's the game of cookies. Now, what is the difference between Orwell's world and ours? Orwell's characters didn't have a choice but to accept it, but we are giving access to our data willingly. Tell me who reads the terms and conditions before giving an app access to our data. Probably no one. But still, we give our consent. Have you ever thought how would this, how would, how would it be if all this information got into the wrong hands? Probably it's in the wrong hands already, or else you wouldn't hear about the social media influencing the US phones. Recent allegations in India about uh, the government using Pegasus to spy on its own people is also a worrying sign. The Indian Express uh, had in 2019 reported that Facebook owned uh, WhatsApp confirmed the use of Pegasus to target journalists and human rights activists in India. WhatsApp had made a disclosure in a lawsuit it had filed against US court in San Francisco. If you had read Animal Farm, Squealer is the character that I'm talking about. Squealer is a second in command of Napoleon and is a minister of propaganda. Boxer, who is symbolic of the Russian middle class, believes every single thing fed to him, though he pays the price for it in the end, where he is sold to the butchery for some wine. In 1984, every person in the world has to work for the party and its quest for the consolidation of power in every way possible. In the novel, we also observe that Winston writes in the journal about his feelings, which is an act in defiance to the party. This also allows the party doesn't even want to want the citizens to talk to themselves and express the feelings. 
it is an extreme case of violation where you are even denied access to write in your own diary the official language of oceania is called new speak quote unquote which is the most peculiar trait of peculiar trait of the decreasing vocabulary every year so if you notice the oxford the dictionary in our in our world we notice that the vocabulary increases every year but in 1984 with the new speak the vocabulary decreases with every year the character saim in the novel tells that there will be a time where there will only be some handful amount of words remaining in the language and the literature from and the, the literature from chaucer to shakespeare will be destroyed and will be never found again this image again presents us with a dangerous situation where a person will not be able to express his or her thoughts because he doesn't know the appropriate word to use in the language obviously a word doesn't exist if i want to tell somebody that i love him or her how how will i tell it if the word love doesn't exist at all so how will i even tell it how will i even explain it so that is a problem that uh, orwell puts in this world and uh, and uh, it this is such a totalitarian world that nobody even wants you to express the feelings which the party doesn't want you okay who, uh, who controls the past controls the future who controls the present controls the past so this quote again is taken from 1984 this is very important to our understanding of orwell's world and uh, as well as our world because uh, this is what exactly is happening our history is being hidden from us as shashi tharur rightly said uh, you can do a levels of history in britain and not know even a word of colonialism and its atrocities doesn't the statement look similar to do we completely know about our history who is teaching history to us what is our source of writing and is everything authentic these are some questions we need to question ourselves now winston also dreams fantasies about sleeping with a dark haired girl julia but they are again interrupted by his faded memories with his mother sleeping with her because she is beautiful isn't the reason with winston he just wants to do it because the act it in itself is the define the party unlike any other sane world where a person has a purgation of feelings when he or she thinks about their past winston doesn't feel any anxiety or sorrow during the dream even at the end of the novel where he admits that he betrayed julia and loved big brother he cannot help but remember freud's psychoanalytic theory on isolation according to him isolation is a defensive mechanism where an unacceptable act or idea is unconsciously removed from a person's memory this theory also finds more strength with the concept of double think again the this term is again introduced by orwell it is an ability to believe one thing while holding the truth under my people are uh, fed the information that a party feels is necessary and also convinces that anything other than the party's principles is blasphemy now similar instances can also be seen in orwell's animal farm the character of snowball which is again an allusion to leon trotsky leon trotsky again was a member was a member of the russian communist party uh, again uh, lenin wanted the trotsky to succeed but again stalin he removed trotsky to uh, for himself to come into power again that's that, that's a different story altogether but it is very important to understand who trotsky was but because if at all stalin hadn't come to the throne and if if uh, trotsky had taken over uh, god knows how uh, how the world would have been in the present day uh, it might have been better it i might have been worse as well we can't again predict what exactly would have happened but the uh, the shift of uh, the power from uh, lenin to stalin is very important and again the the disappearance of snowball in uh, in the animal farm is also peculiar because although anim although snowball fought for the farm in against the humans in the battle of cowshed and the battle of windmill these both are again allusions to the allied invasion of soviet union and the battle of stalingrad in uh, snowball was subjected to an attack uh, by napoleon through his dogs and he was forced out of the farm so snowball was a go to comrade for napoleon but he had to face his wrath when he refused to submit to napoleon's policies as soon as the pig started consolidating power the rest of the animals on the farm were isolated from their rulers the only link remained was squealer who served not only as an intermediary but also as a propaganda machine who fed the inmates of the farm with praises of napoleon the promise of greater equality and violence against animals is broken when the pig start to dominate the politics of the farm it is not too late when the pigs had whips in their hands to punish everyone who would not follow their orders 
every other animal on the farm works either because they are terrified of napoleon or believed in the propaganda that squealer had been spreading in 1984 another instance where we get to notice a gruesome picture of loneliness is a ministry of love again a very ironic name in itself it's a manifestation of the place that o'brien tells he will meet again with winston a place where there is no darkness this is very important for us to understand about orwell and other writers prediction about a future a place where there is no darkness in itself very ironic because in its nature because uh, just just think about it because in such a world there won't be any difference between day and night and such a world is anything but bright even william butler yeats talks about future in his poem the second coming uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre the falcon cannot hear the falconer things fall apart the center cannot hold mere anarchy is loosened upon the world the blood then tied is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned the best lack of conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity the future that yeats is talking about is 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 not bright at all the third line contains things fall apart which chinua achebe takes as a title for his great novel if you look closely into the lines you will clearly notice the words anarchy blood then tied ceremony of innocence is drowned center cannot hold all of these words not only reverberate uh, orwells 1984 and animal farm but also our world after the second world war we had a cold war a missile crisis terrorist attacks proxy wars expansionism and most importantly the quest for domination it can also be identified as as a present day pandemic too because again this the pandemic also served in some way or the other for some countries to exercise domination coming back to 1984 we remember the two minute hate at the start of the novel where everyone would shout slogans denouncing their enemy an individual standing in the group doesn't have to do anything with the enemy but the mob together shows a kind of hatred which is terrifying now this is what we term as mob mentality william faulkner harper lee and many other writers talk about this in their works this cannot be more true today let us look at look at the radical outfits in the world aren't they following the same mob mentality and hate towards others we also have an instance where uh, winston is in the ministry and watches fellow people suffer through torment he realizes that his time is up but the most interesting fact that winston realizes is o'brien isn't a part of brotherhood brotherhood which is a secret organization working to overthrow the party ingsoc ingsoc is again a word play on the word english socialism but a member uh, but again o'brien is a member of the party who is bent to challenge william uh, winston's thoughts this is where we find one of the most famous catch phrases of double think 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 that is you will have to believe whatever i say is truth if i say if i show you a rose and say it's a lily then it is lily it is not rose you shouldn't believe that it is rose if you believe that it is a rose then you are defying the party that's as simple as that these totalitarian states again that uh, orwell uh, depicts us rest on the idea of propaganda Uh, and tool to use of freedom and isolate people to consolidate power this reminds me of a great florentine writer nicolo machiavelli and his street is the prince the prince is an instruction guide for new princes and royals written by nicolo machiavelli a statesman in florentine republic uh, florence is present day uh, in italy but at that point of time it was a separate it was an independent republic florence the general theme of the prince is of not of accepting that the aims of princes such as glory and survival can justify the use of immoral means to achieve those ends machiavelli states that in the prince that if there arises a situation for a ruler that he has to choose whether he has to be loved or feared it is better for him to choose the latter that is he should be feared in both the dystopian worlds that orwell depicts it is fear that is driving the plot plot factor isn't it fear that our personal uh, plots in our lives go as well don't don't we fear something and not do it is it for it is here for everyone has to think if i fear something am i doing it or am i not doing it does it influence my thinking power or not this is this is a big important question for us to answer to napoleon in animal farm starts with a low key and again maintains good relations with everyone on the farm but as soon as he starts consolidating power he starts con- uh, conducting purges where he would get all the animals against him uh, executed as mentioned earlier the fox the horse boxer is a representation of the russian working classes who believe that the propaganda 
that the state supplied that means the squealer supplied uh, when many of the animals were suspecting of the intentions of napoleon and his ambitious nature boxer was the one who stayed loyal showing quote napoleon is always right when boxer is sent to the slaughter house with the fact that he represented the working class makes this decision of napoleon so much more dramatic if someone so loyal as boxer can be sent to the slaughter house to be killed in cold blood so that the pigs can buy whiskey it could happen to anyone the knowledge that stalin was willing to kill the people who founded his revolution makes this moment in the novel very much traumatic napoleon used his guard dogs to keep an eye on everyone on the farm and carry out purges if someone was against them isn't political killing happening today yes it is happening not a day goes by without hearing news about a political murder 1984 is a world where three superpowers eurasia east asia and oceania are at perpetual war with each other no two powers will unite to destroy the other and establish peace it is done to devoid people of the resources that could be used to make their lives better it also helps the ruling elite to consolidate power to an extent that there is no freedom left in any sphere among the common folk the party also carries out public hangings and secret purges where people are vaporized a term in which uh, the which in the novel means that they have been wiped out from existence and have become an unperson that means if there exists a person named padmanabh reddy today and uh, if the government wanted me to be vaporized then everything from my social media accounts to any article on the internet or my uh, records of birth certificates or college records everything will be wiped out it will be as if i didn't exist at all children are again taught to spy on their parents and report to the thought police thought police again if they find anything which goes against the party philosophy this isolates the parents who in almost cases don't have any feelings for each other the wife and husband almost in every case they don't have feelings for each other because we have seen if they have feelings they'll be killed that's it so uh, they again this again creates this design creates isolation from their children as well we also find a man who is very proud that his child had caught him talking in sleep and reported to the thought police fear in the minds of people is also shown by the fact that thought crime quote and quote a term orwell used to describe having a negative thought about a party or its principles is punishable by the thought police when winston is taken to the ministry of love he is astonished to look at many people whom he already knew suffering under the thought police's brutality we are also introduced to an old man who begs to do anything with him than to take to room 101 room 101 it is a basement torture chamber in the ministry of love in which the party attempts to subject a prisoner their own worst nightmare fear or phobia with the objective of breaking down their resistance the old man even offers to let his family killed in cold blood in front of him and also his own life winston never realizes the brutality of room 101 until he is taken in himself he is broken down by o'brien and rest of the thought police in isolation to a point where he accepts double think and the party's principles but he re- but he reveals that he hadn't betrayed julia which triggers o'brien to take winston to room 101 where a person is exposed to his greatest fear and in the case of winston it was a rats it didn't take long enough for him to kill his feelings for julia and then become the most isolated that he ever was this installation of fear and subjection to uh, isolation solidifies machiavelli's observation that it is great to be loved but to cling on to power for a longer period the population has to fear the ruler which is true in case of big brother now to conclude everything george orwell was one of the greatest writers that britain ever produced his novels animal farm and 1984 show us a reality that many of us fail to notice every state which starts with the promise of revolution ultimately descends into a totalitarian state both of these books are again a warning to mankind about the greatest threats that can arise due to a ambition of a few many of orwell's prophecies in 1984 have come true in uh, contemporary times we as a society are the most connected to each other than ever but at the same time we are also most isolated than ever i am connected to you people online but i cannot meet you in person what does that make me does it make me more connected or does it make me more isolated privacy again has become non existent with the vast cultural influence of social media which stores our private information 
we do know we, we do know that we give them the information with consent but it is scary to even imagine the implications of this and this information falling in the wrong hands and the prophecy that orwell had made was a telescreen keeping an eye on everyone we cannot help but the but think about the cctv cameras around the cities that monitor people around them the other propaganda that orwell talked about is apt to this day where a group expresses a belief and their leader for whatever pro- pragmatic ends that desire, desire exposes the opposite belief and everyone who follows them now this is this is not only switches what they believe in but deny that they were believed in anything at all this is the warning that 1984 provides us it tells us to catch ourselves to stop ourselves in the moment and remember that we actually believe rather than in the group what we belong to tell us because the alternative will lead us to tyranny to sum up my speech i would like to again quote orwell's line all animals are the same but some animals are more equal than the other thank you uh thank you mr reddy for this very wonderful and you know very thought provoking presentation and you know i'm very sure that our listeners uh, might have got you know a lot to take at uh, take from this talk and you know george orwell as you said is more relevant today than ever you know after 70 years of his death you know some of the terms used by him you know the situation cited by him like you know horrors of dictatorship the corruption of language endless spying on citizens concept of equality just being in the books not just find you know reflection is in uh, in his terms like of that of you know as you talked about like newspeak big brother etc but are relevant today also let me cite one example so recently as you also mentioned that uh, the news of pegasus uh, the pegasus spying so retired justice b n sri krishna on this very pegasus case said that if the reports are true we may be sliding into an orwellian state with big brother snooping on us you know this is just a single example uh, even the courts have cited uh, several examples uh, you know one might very well remember the case of uh, rajasthan uh, rajasthan minister salary's amendment act of uh, 2017 uh, which was bro- brought under vasundhara rajee's government so basically this amendment said that the previous chief ministers would be getting some of the perks uh, you know like uh, some residential benefits some uh, allowances uh, as compared to uh, which of the current chief ministers but uh, of course this matter reached to the judiciary and what the court observed was you know very truly remarkable let me quote what actually the court said so the court said that all power is public trust to be hold on and for behalf of the public and for their benefit and once the holder of such power stray from the path of rectitude and help themselves to the public benevolence the essence of the democratic democratic principle in equality is violated one is reminded of the george orwell's portrayal of a distort, distorted <coughs> sorry distorted meaning of equality in his much celebrated animal farm that all animals are born equal but some are more equal than the others so these were just few examples you know that how relevant is the work of george orwell even today so i would totally recommend to all the listeners you know uh, if they haven't gone through his works then at least uh, they should go through it and you know then only they can find how relevant george orwell is today uh, now with this let us move to some of the questions that were put up by our listeners so the first question is from uh, divya tyagi uh, she is asking that a critical study of machiavelli's prince shows that the book was controversial in certain aspects how do you think orwell justifies his work 1984 by connecting it with the prince yeah it's a really really good question actually so you know uh, machiavelli again machiavelli was a controversial figure in himself when he wrote the prince it was again viewed as if viewed as if he is supporting monarchy but again he wasn't supporting monarchy at all he is telling how he is kind of again telling people how uh, how monarchs and how the rulers in the aristocracy or how the how the people who are kings these guys how they can bend you how they can how how they can use everything that uh, that you have to turn to turn to themselves and rule rule with a iron fist and again here itself and again orwell orwell to uh, what he does he is not supporting totalitarianism in any aspect he is not glorifying it he is telling okay guys look at it if if something descends if something descends to totalitarianism it will cause it it will cause such level of problem 
this uh, orwell orwell's idea was the same to educate people about uh, totalitarianism and again uh, in uh, prince in machiavelli's case he was also educating people that uh, if you leave if you leave people uh, if you leave people in the aristocracy or the monarchy uh, those people will literally sap out the blood in you these were the, the, this the, this is the reason why i connected both of these things uh, okay thank you mr reddy uh, another question is from uh, mr archana bharti uh, she is asking that george orwell's works are influenced by the modernism movement of that era and however uh, we find that uh, george orwell's dystopian world is you know even present in the present time so can we say that the movement of modernism can be seen again in the literature so in modernism modernism in itself again uh, the people who were in modernism didn't know that they were in modernism again any literary period that we talk about they don't if they, we are living in post modernism because somebody termed it as post modernism so again uh, the people who were living in modernism they didn't know that they were living in modernism in literary in literary language if i have to put it uh, the the time where uh, george orwell was writing it was it was in 1940 1945 one book came out in 1949 one book came out so this was a this was a late modernism that was taking around again a period that gone that the period that has been gone by if we take if we take the writings and the style of modernism modernism what does what does modernism tell about writing style it tells that uh, the conventional writing styles which existed in the 19th century those kind of writing styles will not be repeated uh, the writing styles will be somewhat different that we notice in heart of darkness in, Ms., in mrs dalloway in great gatsby in many other works like that but uh, when we come to orwell he again shifts a kind of writing and to, uh, to answer your question that uh, uh, in uh, can we see a kind of modernism coming back uh, we are living in a post modern world so we have gone past the modernism now Uh, thank you, Mr. Padmava. Uh, another question is from Ms. Samriddhi Kanpal. Uh, she is asking uh, one of Orwell's friend, Geoffrey Go- uh, Geoffrey Gorer, told Orwell uh, regarded psychoanalysis with mild hostility. What are your views on the fact that although Freud was reluctant to the political and social advancement of the psychoanalytic works, and Orwell was more inclined to uh, depicting the political and social life from the psychological perspective? the two of them connect in various ways so what are your views regarding this yes this is again very very important question uh, that uh, samriddhi has put up you know uh, freud and freud freud and orwell both talked about psycho so psychological aspects but both of them lived lives differently uh, freud was again a doctor living in good living in good conditions in uh, vienna again uh, he had a life he had a life full of books and all he lived a very good life a very comfortable life and then again he experimented with his patients uh, with uh, with various psychoanalytic theories and all but when we come to orwell orwell talked about the political scenes because he lived a life filled with these political circles first he lived in first he lived in burma then he then he came back to spain he fought a civil war there and he got he shot he got shot in his eye too and uh, it uh, it almost made him blind it almost killed him but you know uh, orwell was more affected personally uh, in this political scenario than freud freud actually was again reluctant to use uh, reluctant to not uh, again not use uh, use of these things is because uh, freud again his works will get scrutinized by the government in uh, vienna austrian government will scrutinize his works if uh, if he goes political but again orwell he knew that he is what he is writing is actually true because uh he himself has been suffer he himself has been a sufferer of many things that is my take on uh, both of these things uh, thank you mr reddy for this very interesting question now huh? so it's time to invite our honorable guest teacher dr sachin nirmala narayan for his indispensable comment on the topic talk and event as well sir on the behalf of entire fraternity i would like to extend humble request to you grace us with your intellect and valuable remarks uh thank you once again and uh, like i'll try to present two or three cogent uh, inputs uh, for uh, patmanabha as well as uh, people who have uh, tuned in to listen today i guess uh, so uh, like uh, say of course a teacher uh, should give you confidence should show that kind of affect and care for uh, the students and uh, the topic under discussion but the teacher should also give you 
a certain kind of um, critique that will enable you to pursue knowledge uh, in an uncompromising manner so i think you know that is also equally the task of a uh, teacher and the teacher is never a teacher alone teacher is always a teacher learner in my understanding uh, if the teacher cannot be a learner then uh, uh, teacher cannot teach like so these two things go together so in my understanding uh, padmanabha made a very uh, sincere effort to understand uh, the dystopian aspects of uh, george orwell's fiction and make it com- contemporaneous to make it relevant to uh, our everyday uh, situations Uh, and there lies the precise uh, point epiphanic point or the moment that we should uh, like introspect why is it relevant uh, like does that mean that we should have a certain take on what is happening around us uh, he mentioned pegasus uh, other people saurav and others who like you know voiced uh, the written down questions they also brought in a lot of points so why is it relevant are we doing enough to fight uh, totalitarianism uh, in our midst or are we just uh, like consuming things are we just reading orwell as a product uh, are we just reading 1984 or animal farm as books we buy from amazon and uh, like we have some ownership over that are we trying to bridge or are we trying to cross that Uh, so that's a very important question for me so what you have in orwell 1945 and 1949 i'm mentioning the years of publication of the uh, books that uh, patmanabha discussed with us prior to that there is another orwell that uh, uh, he mentioned in passing whether it is down and out in uh, paris and london or uh, uh, like a vegan pure kind of stuff where he is advocating a certain commitment to a political ideology he is trenchantly anti totalitarian but he is uh, and he is a very uh, strident critic of uh, stalin uh, but he is also a strident critic of uh, nazi germany and his understanding of anti totalitarianism is not without a concomitant endorsement of democratic socialism this is something that i want patmanabha to take note of and also for all others to digest because uh, it is not happening in an abstraction of some kind of good versus evil battle a kind of binary between uh, stalin and the rest of the world he was trenchantly anti totalitarian but he also trenchantly advocated democratic socialism are we ready to process that uh, dystopia has to be understood as part and parcel of the utopian urge in all of us uh, i i don't think you know utopia was mentioned as a point of discussion there is no need for that but dystopia uh, is a critique of what is uh, you know or what should a critique that should enable us to reach utopia uh, it, it is a very simple formulation uh, patmanabha talked about um, the importance of darkness to understand the relevance of light right uh, so you have asimov's uh, nightfall nightfall uh, uh, you have uh, the planet called lagash uh, you uh, sakshya uh, is a history society so uh, lagash is a sumerian city of yore uh, the ancient sumerian civilization of uh, iraq uh, like present day iraq so but in lagash in asimov's lagash Uh, the sun never sets not the imperial sun but there are six stars that illuminate lagash continuously and there is no night fall so once there is this po- possibility of the uh, burning out of one of the suns one of the six suns of lagash the planet there is this imminent possibility of a night fall you know like uh, you are not experienced uh, about uh, darkness you don't have a night so you are not uh, understanding the implications of it so dystopia in that sense is a search and a critique of the evils and the inequalities the iniquities that exist amongst us so that is why taking sides is a very important question orwell was never an armchair 
uh, critique of the system. He plunged deep into uh, whether it's uh, the Republican uh, Spain or uh, whether it's the uh, tramp houses in London and, uh, uh, you know, like rural England. He was very much there presenting a, a, a position. And rather than that, uh, you know, not, he was not a fence sitter. So when Pegasus is happening, when Bhima Koregao is, uh, you know, uh, inviting a backlash, when there is statist uh, totalitarianism, even in India, can we, can we just uh, read Orwell as a, an academic text? Can we not, you know, engage with Orwell uh, instead of uh, just, uh, you know, hiding behind the usual courts? Uh, like in uh, 84, you have uh, the two minutes hate thing. What we have uh, around us is 24 hours of hate not just two minutes hate, a festival of light, Diwali, which we uh, celebrated right now, becomes uh, an occasion to uh, assert uh, some kind of, um, you know, exclusivity. Oh, we will burn trackers because only, uh, you know, tracker bands are only there against a particular community's festival. Uh, like, you know, these are the kind of uh, things that we get to hear, uh, like right in the midst of our own everyday lives. So I want uh, all of you who have engaged in this, uh, you know, one hour uh, with this topic, including Patmanabha, to make that transition like that. Uh, in that sense, uh, I think we cannot escape the, the question of commitment on the part of the academic, the teacher learner, the student. The student uh, has to understand the nuances of all these things and then take a position. So I think, you know, I've taken my uh, like six, seven minutes or even 10 minutes, but I'll stop here. And uh, maybe, you know, Patmanabha can give us a quick rejoinder. But uh, I would insist for the rest of the people who tuned in to listen to not uh, like, you know, just take uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, example out of Orwell as a, a successful author or, a you know, like influential author, but as a person who committed himself to certain positions uh, in life. So I would request all of you to do that. And maybe, you know, uh, Patmanabha can give a one minute kind of, you know, rejoinder or something. That's how discuss, uh, like, you know, like the role as a discussant uh, should translate into that. So uh, thank you for this, uh, uh, you know, Shamdal College and uh, the Evening. history of the yeah. And, and about my students. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. You know, like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, Padna, uh, Mr. Reddy, uh, if you want to uh, like uh, give uh, some idea about uh, uh, like George Orwell, can you uh, you go ahead? Uh, and you have six yes, minutes. Yes, time. Yeah. Yes, yes, surely, sir. Sir, whatever sort, uh, sir talked about that absolutely is true. Uh, when we look at uh, present context and the nightfall, then the nightfall reference uh, that that was absolutely on point. I didn't think about nightfall when I was writing this because nightfall isn't again a dystopian text uh, to talk about that. But again, Orwell, when we uh, when we talk about today, we have to look at it as a uh, as a kind of a uh, what what do we call it? Cautionary tale. Cautionary tale. Uh, we have to look at it as a cautionary tale so that we don't make mistakes uh, that uh, that Orwell is warning us about. So you take this step, this will happen. So please don't take this step. So that is what Orwell is warning us about. Always telling, okay, don't go this way. You will, if you will go this way, then you are bound. You are you are bound to you are bound to be doomed. So that that again uh, is very important for us to understand. Uh, not only reading about Orwell, but also of every single literary text. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.